Welcome back to the program. I'm Ann Fisher, Senior Editor at PV Magazine USA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second session of the day, Cell and Module Production, What Technologies Will Lead and Why. For this session, I'd like to introduce our next moderator, Jonathan Gifford, Editor-in-Chief of PV Magazine. With a huge volume of tax credits available to clean technology manufacturers under the Inflation Reduction Act, there's no better time for PV production to take off in the United States, but manufacturers will have to act fast. Thank you for jo joining this session of PV Magazine's Roundtables US 2023, the Cell and Module Technology Session. While the IRA makes speed a vir virtue due to its 10-year tenor, establishing a vertically integrated solar facility is no small task. So what shape is PV manufacturing in the US taking? What level of vertical integration can be achieved? And what technologies are best suited to both the rapid rollout and also long-term competitiveness? We've got some excellent speakers today to address these and other questions relating to Made in the USA Solar. Well, our first presenter is an entrepreneur and solar business development professional. He has extensive experience in commercial solar development, finance, design, engineering, sales, and general management. His company, Trina Solar, has announced an eventual five gigawatt PV module fab in Wilmer, Texas. Please join us in welcoming John Shaw, utility scale PV module sales manager in the US for Trina Solar. Hi, John. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity very much. And please take it away with your presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity to give a little bit of uh, background on Trina Solar, uh, kind of our ro technological roadmap and some of our plans for the future, specifically in the context of U.S. manufacturing. So I'll start to share my screen and hope for the best here. Thumbs up if it looks good to you. All right, great. Let's see. One second, I have to get to my control screen. There we go. So uh, first of all, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on Trina Solar. Uh, one really interesting thing to me is that Trina Solar has been around since 1997. Our current chairman is the founder of Trina Solar, Japan Gao. Uh, the, the thing that's particularly unique about um, being around for 26 years now is, unfortunately, I, I can sheepishly admit that uh, in, in 2006, 2007, I bought a residential solar system. And unfortunately, one of my modules had an issue. Long story short, that, that company's not around anymore. So <laughs> I think it's really important to have... Uh, a, to utilize a technology from a company that either has been around um, for you know the length of perhaps their warranties that they offer and or that's strong enough or bankable enough to appear to be uh, able to be around for that long. Um, we, were, we, we were listed on the Shanghai Stock Exchange in 2020. We now have 30,000 employees. We have offices or operations in 18 countries. We have factories in four countries, including the U.S., which was announced the day before RE Plus this year. Uh, and I'll, I have a separate slide on that that I'll go into in a moment. Um, we have uh, 160 business in 160 different uh, countries. We've shipped over 150 gigawatts total in, in, our, in our life thus far. And we're on track to import over four gigawatts into the U.S. this year. We have already successfully imported over three gigawatts of modules from our Southeast Asian uh, plants uh, as of the end of Q3. All of well, something that's unique for us is, you know, we 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 currently source for the U.S. market. We have our own supply chain. We have our own factories. We currently source all of our polysilicon from outside of China. We have we just opened uh, about a month and a half ago, our own ingot and wafering facility outside of China. We have had a cell and module factory outside of China for the last couple of years. Um, something else that's rather unique, I think, about uh, Trina Solar is, for example, in 2021, 
we spent 6% of our operating revenue on R&D. That amounted to well over $300 million. We currently hold 1,300 patents. We have 25 world records for cell efficiency and module power. I think all of these are, are quite relevant to today's conversation about technology uh, and U.S. manufacturing because of uh, the advent and, and invention of two, 210 millimeter cells and on top of that, N-type Topcon uh, technology. So this is a, a little bit of a technological historical roadmap of where we started and, and where we are now. Uh, interestingly, over the, as you can see, uh, over the last 14 years, our wattages have increased, our wattage per panel has increased 133%. That, that amounts to approximately 10% or 40 watts per year. Now, of course, that's not the whole story. Um, it's more than just how many watts are per module. You can grow a module with the same power density, but we are also increasing power density uh, from basically from 16.6% all the way up to 22.2%. That's a 34% gain. If you, if you also look a little bit more closely at this chart, you can see since, uh, since 2019, uh, we've gained over 300 watts per module, 20% gain. And that's in no small part due to the advent and invention of N-type. Well, I shouldn't, you know, obviously there's been a negatively charged modules for around for quite a while, but uh, 210 millimeter cells and Topcon N-type technology. Um, you, another interesting thing about this, uh, you may notice that in about 2019, we jumped from using the 166 millimeter M6 cell all the way up to the 210 millimeter cell. Uh, which is also known as the M12, perhaps G12. I sometimes get confused on that, so I apologize. So uh, this slide is going to be introducing our, our, our newest residential module, the Vertex S+. The actual module uh, is called the NE09RC.05. It is an all-black module has low weight, and it integrates with most all racking and inverters. It is bifacial. There is no back sheet, therefore. Now, a lot of people say, why bother doing that for residential? Well, first of all, this can be used for commercial and industrial as well. And a lot of flat, uh, flat rooftops, flat roof installations are uh, ballasted and tilted, whether five degree or 10 degree. And many of those roofs are white EPDM uh, type roofs. So there is some potential gain there. The other, the other reason, even in a residential flush mounted uh, system, Although there may not be much gain from the backside, we really do prefer using uh, dual glass. We found that um, back sheets are, you know, historically kind of a, a point of, of uh, you know, a, a challenge in the warranty area. So dual glass seems to really eliminate a lot of those challenges. So the, the other thing that's quite unique about this is we're using a 210 millimeter cell, but it's, you notice the R. The R represents rectangular. So this is technically a 210 millimeter by 182 millimeter cell. Um, the thing about that is, is it brings some of the, the benefits of 210 millimeter, which are uh, by definition a lower voltage cell, but then the width of a 182 millimeter, that kind of allows us to uh, have a form factor or width of a lot of competition. And, and it allows for rather simple um, design, uh, racking design uh, swaps, shall we say. Another unique thing is we use uh, third cut cells. This helps lower amps, which makes it more compatible uh, with module level power, power electronics and partners. That um, technology of, of cutting is, is, is also known as non-destructive. Well, we use non-destructive cutting technology that minimizes micro cracks and improves mechanical strength and obviously reduces uh, waste and breakage. Um, the N-type technology also um, kind of by definition brings a, a lower temperature coefficient. What that translates to is less heat loss in high heat. I'm sorry, less voltage loss in high heat. Uh, lastly, uh, the last two quick things is this module has a 25 year power warranty, which is kind of industry standard, but it's also got a 25 year product warranty. Uh, and then another thing that's uh, rather unique to N-type technology is the low LID and PID. So um, the warranty states less than 1% uh, uh, first year 
loss and less than 0.4% annual attenuation. So this is just a look at uh, basically uh, all of the modules that we're currently uh, utilizing the 210 millimeter N-type TopCon technology in. I guess real quickly, why don't I explain uh, what TopCon technology is? It's an advanced N-type silicon cell technology that combines an oxide layer with a perk solar cell to further reduce recombination losses and increase efficiency of the solar cell. In N-type solar cells, the base layer is doped with phosphorus, which has one more electron than silicon, making the cell negatively charged. This doping generates free electrons, which is why N-type cells return higher efficiency values and, and uh, than P-type cells. So uh, interestingly here, I'll go back to the slide but more specifically, the first two modules, we already went over the residential uh, DE09. The, the middle one is our NEG19. Both of those use the uh, G12R cell technology. So again, 210 by 182 millimeters, and that's allowing uh, a width form factor that's kind of industry standard. The, the module on the right is yet to be released in, in North America, at least. That will be our large format module. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a 210 by 210 millimeter uh, N-type top con technology, and it will reach up to 700 watts uh, once, once we get that line up and running and efficiencies are gained. I already spoke a little bit about this uh, NEG21 NEG uh, on the last slide, so I'll move on. This is the NEG19. I'll just note here, it looks like I have about a minute left. So we, we have a Black and Beach study on LCOE of this module. The interesting thing is, is this NEG19 uh, in, in, the, uh, in the experimental kind of project um, with controlled variables had 1.9% uh, lower insulation cost and 3% better LCOE than 182 millimeter P-type competitors. We are one of only two companies that have scored, uh, uh, sorry, had been a, a PVAL top performer for the last nine years in a row. This really, um, this leads in part uh, to the fact that we are considered by PV Tech um, a AAA bankable entity, and we're also a Bloomberg New Energy uh, Fund uh, bankable solar module company. That can help with some non-recourse financing. So wrapping up, um, we do really feel like, uh, you know, it's important to have uh, solutions all across the solar development um, kind of arena. So we do offer utility scale uh, storage solutions as well as racking solutions. We have, this slide says we have 60 dedicated people. We actually have over 70 now in the U.S. supporting all all departments from logistics to sales to marketing to uh, legal, et cetera. And then lastly, our US manufacturing facility. We announced this, as I mentioned uh, last, or, or, or uh, yeah, last month. This facility was a speculative development. So it already has uh, ground walls and roof. We're just basically making the inside as we need it. And uh, it will be five gigawatts with uh, a gigawatt of residential and four gigawatts of utility scale. It's going to be bringing over 1,500 jobs to, uh, to the U.S. Hey, listen, I, uh, I think my time's up, so I really appreciate the opportunity again. Jonathan, PV Magazine, and I really look forward to hearing from Alex, Tristan, Minois, and Kim on the panel discussion to come. So thank you kindly. Well, excellent. Thank you very much, John Shaw. He is the Utility Scale PV Module Sales Manager for Trina Solar in the US. John, thank you for that presentation. Great to have some insights into TopCon technology, which we're going to discuss in the panel discussion, as you alluded to. You also mentioned glass-glass uh, uh, glass modules and, and also cell cracking and what Trina's doing to, in, to prevent cell cracking. These are going to be discussed in our next session, which is the quality session. So make sure you stick around for that. But next up in this session today, we welcome expert panelists to discuss the technologies at the front and center of this huge manufacturing investment cycle currently underway. That's just after this. Well, it's clear that uh, Trina Solar, as we just heard, is betting big on TopCon technology. The PV manufacturing landscape remains a really diverse one. 
Petrojunction is very much a mature technology and the presence of domestic producer First Solar has ensured that thin film and cadmium telluride technology in particular remains a prominent part of the US solar marketplace. To discuss the outlook for solar module manufacturing in the United States, we've assembled a panel of four speakers. Alex Barrows is the head of PV at solar manufacturing consultancy Exawatt. Alex's work has a particular focus on forecasting the efficiency and cost evolution of solar technologies, and he has a PhD in the physics of perovskite-based solar cells from the University of Sheffield. Tristan Arian Lorico is the VP of Sales and Marketing at Quality Assurance Provider PVEL. He oversees PVEL's commercial activities and collaborates with PV module buyers, investors, research institutions, and manufacturers to develop innovative performance and reliability test programs for product qualification. Minois Leon, Leon, my apologies, is the senior engineer for solar technology at independent assurance and risk management provider DNV. Minois' current role at DNV focuses on technical reviews of module inverter and mounting and tracker systems to assess long term reliability. And Kim Pimirano is a VP energy and infrastructure development at Nevada based project developer Estuary Power. Kim has over 20 years of renewable energy management and related experience focused on, on asset management, construction, operations, maintenance, safety, and quality assurance. Welcome, everyone, to Roundtables US 2023. I'll kick things off with you, Alex, first of all. In the previous session, we heard from Christian Rosalind from CEA about how they're tracking the, the manufacturing expansion that's currently underway in the US. Uh, from Exawatt's perspective, how, is it, how are you seeing things play out in terms of uh, ingot wafer, but in particular cell and, and module capacities uh, coming online within the US? Yeah, so there's, there's obviously a large amount of announcements that have come out. Um, realistically, not all of those will end up coming online in the, in the future. Um, but if we if we saw everyone do what they're they're intending to do, you know, by the end of 2026, you could have 90 gigawatts of module capacity, 45 of cell, 30 of wafer, very roughly. We think realistically we're looking at closer to 60 gigawatts of module, around 20 gigawatts of cell, and similar around 20 gigawatts of wafer potentially as well. Um, so around a, a third of the industry could be integrated upstream into into cell and wafer in some way in the US. Okay, and, and what are the other implications for that kind of mix, um, where you still have a, a solid amount, two thirds of the production capacity reliant on imports for, for wafers uh, cells? Yeah, so that, that's where the, the module only manufacturers in the US have to be very careful uh, about where, you know, they're sourcing strategies for cells where they're sourcing them from, whether there's a risk of any tariffs on those cells that they're sourcing, and whether there's a risk of those getting hit by detentions around UFLPA. Um, so where, you know, if they're sourcing a cell from someone in India or in Southeast Asia, where is the wafer coming from and where is the poly coming from? Um, so there's a, you know, just because you're module only in the US um, doesn't mean that you can ignore all of those other challenges. Okay, thank you, Tristan. I'll head to you next. Um, we've had a, a huge number of announcements, manufacturing announcements, and as Alex was saying, not all of these will be realized. What are some of the constraints that these prospective manufacturers are encountering? Oh, I, I think it runs the gamut from, um, you know, un we heard a lot on the last session about un uncertainty on, you know, domestic content. So I think, you know, some of these announcements, they were um hoping that, that the domestic content would would go in their favor maybe for module only and now they're seeing well i'm gonna need you know module plus cell probably and that that might cause them to to pause um i've also heard about shortages you know transformer shortages uh some of these people have showed up um uh, wanting to you know, build a, a a building, but they can't get local permitting or or whatever. You know, it's it's very difficult, as we heard on the last session, to to restart a whole manufacturing sector uh, in the industry that's basically not been here for for twenty years, save for for a few of the smaller uh, manufacturers that have still been you know putting up a a fight since then. So, you know, there's 
there's a lot to be done. I, I, I think some manufacturers are, are on their way. You know, it was good to hear from Christian that seven manufacturers have uh, received equipment. Um, you know, that's seven more than last year, probably. So, so that's, that's encouraging, <laughs> but you know, anyone placing uh, orders for gigawatts of domestically made modules in 2024 with domestically made cells into them, you know, unless that's for, for first solar, you're probably going to be pretty disappointed by the end of the year when, when you're not receiving your, your domestic module. It, it takes a long time to get these factories up and running. And, you know, staffing is another issue. Um, we've got a oh, lot of people to I, train. To bring I back actually wanted to, to, to ask about staffing. So, you know, it's not only um manufacturing workers it's also expertise cell manufacturing itself is you know it's not a low tech process and you might not be able to buy for example a, a, a turnkey uh topcon line just off the shelf and and have it installed so so how big is this challenge in terms of staffing and, and experience and expertise tristan i think it's in, in my opinion one of the biggest you know we we run PVAL in in California and you know we've we've got a small team of engineers and we're it, we we find it difficult to have just you know four or five engineers that really know their stuff on, on module technology um and you know we're going to need i don't know four or 5000 <laughs> to run all of these uh 100 gigawatts of of plants so you know it's it's a challenge and i think it behooves all of us in the industry to to well hope this session is is a good one hopefully there's people new to the industry attending but you know we we need to pass that knowledge along um if if we're going to be successful yeah thank you for that well um looking more deeply into crystalline silicon manufacturing in particular minwa from dnv i'd like to bring you into the conversation now how how is dnv seeing um the, the breakdown of crystalline silicon uh technologies um in particular in the us marketplace i mentioned hetero junction earlier we saw trina going big on topcon how does dnv see it yeah, I, we we definitely Perk is still a um, huge part part of the mix, and Topcon is the the big the big player that we see the industry going towards, um, and I think that's going to be the majority of 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 the market. Um, and you know, with with uh, the there there have been a lot of talks about um, hetero junction and maybe in the future um, that will become a part of things as well. Um, but in, in in theory, it's it's maybe simple, but I, I think the the actual manufacturing um, and going through implementing the actual steps is quite is, is quite complex. So I I think from from just from a general industry standpoint and from what we're hearing from all the different people that DNV interacts with on projects and procurement, uh, we see we see Topcon really being the main um, the main technology in the, at least in just in the next few years. Okay. So that's an interesting take. Topcon really um, is being uh, predicted to kind of dominate in the short term from DNV's perspective. We have heard an announcement. Um, Maya Berger, um, the Swiss or Ger German uh, manufacturer, will be setting up a hetero junction cell and module fab um, in the US. That was one recent announcement. But, you know, M Maya Berger, for example, is quite an experienced technology provider, equipment provider. Um, some of the manufacturers are, are less experienced. Um, of course, Trina is a completely different kettle of fish with, with many gigawatts of capacity in China and Southeast Asia. Um, but when you're setting up a new module factory, there are risks and DNV, DNV is, um, you know, deeply involved in risk assessment. How risky do you think some of these products could be? I, yeah, I, I mean, I think from looking historically speaking, um, I mean, anytime there's new technology, there's always going to be to be some risk out there. Um, but 
really economics drive the the market and if there is if there is an um, an issue that with a particular technology that is uh, economically viable then we we see that that uh, that 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 particular issue gets you know fixed right away if um or you know fi- there are there's a huge uh, momentum to try and and um, ad- address or mitigate that that risk um so things like PID or L- LID LETID in the past that have come up um so i think then the the market and the industry kind of naturally um is motivated to address those technological issues when 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 they arise, um, and but but in general, um, it all goes back to extended duration. There, there, there's two there's there's two pieces. One one piece is um, the the design of the module, uh, what what the technology risk is in terms of the design of the module, and then the other piece is the the risk in terms of production quality in the manufacturing side of things. And um, and so those are the two key things that we look for when we're doing, um, when we're assessing module, module risk. Um, and so those two things, um, to address those two things, um, really it's about um, extended duration testing um, and which speaks to the the design of the module um, and how, you know, how, um, uh, you know, whether that design has been really put through the ringer and tested. Um, and then the other um, part of the manufacturing quality um, is really looking at um, factory audits, um, production quality uh, reports, monitoring and um, and witnessing and pre-inspection reports and things like that. So those become in- increasingly important. I mean, they're already important uh, in looking in assessing project risk. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Um, Kim Primarano, I would like to bring you into the conversation from Estuary Power. From a developer standpoint, we heard in the previous um, session that you know, it can be quite economically attractive to use these locally produced modules, including even modules with locally produced cells. Um, how closely are you looking at it from a developer standpoint? How attractive is it for you to use made in the USA modules? You know, I'm pretty risk adverse. <laughs> and so I don't usually like to be the first one off the production line. Um, and so currently, because all of our projects are Intermountain West um, and kind of in the retired coal plant um, census tracts, we are not currently modeling domestic content. Um, we are closely tracking it and closely monitoring it. And I, I am hopeful that in the future we will, especially if those numbers that Alex was projecting come true, then I think that that'll drive price down, that'll, that'll drive capacity up. And it'll be something that we start to think about. But um, here at Estuary, we're, we're eight people and we're pretty risk adverse. Okay, that makes sense. And, and what about from a technology standpoint, then uh, how closely are you looking at these kind of end type technologies like Topcon or maybe even heterojunction? Um, we are definitely looking at TopCon, and we are planning for our um, upcoming projects to all to all be TopCon. Um, and that has just been based on you know reading all of the reports and talking to manufacturers and and um, starting to set up those third party audits and and things like that. But um, so we are we're definitely open to new technology. I think I'm just really really risk adverse when it comes to you know, I mean, setting up a factory, setting up a, a, um, a clean room, like these are not easy feats. And to, to Tristan's point earlier, I think probably the labor piece is the thing that's most concerning with me. And so I think that's why um, I've been hesitant to really, to really focus on domestic content at this time and just looked at, you know, really, really improving um the performance in in a standard form factor module yeah okay thank you for that let's keep going looking at uh technology tristan from pvel um like what are you seeing in terms of 
test results. Um, Kim was telling us she's pretty risk adverse, averse when it comes to looking at new technologies. What are you seeing in terms of performance of uh, and reliability of uh, heterojunction Topcon? Perk is pretty well understood, I imagine. Yeah. So, I mean, stepping back, I think for all of our testing, like PVL has been testing for 12 years or more. Um, and, and what we see is when new technology is introduced, there's a, a wide range of results. Some manufacturers already know what they're doing. They're leading the market and, you know, they would be in the scorecard as top performers. Others still have some learning to do. And we saw that with, you know, the new glass glass modules and the new um, multi bus bar modules and perk modules. You know, Minwa mentioned LETID was a huge issue. And for the most part, the industry solved that. I will, as an aside, say we haven't solved PID yet. Minwa, we can talk about that if you want, but PID is still an issue. Anyway, what we see is, you know, there's a, a range of results. And over time, that range tightens and the modules, almost all of them become top performers or, you know, have have industry leading um, degradation rates or low degradation rates to, to flip that a bit. But um, so I think we, you know, we see that now playing out with Topcon. We see that playing out with HJT. Both of them have introduced new risks. You know, both are more delicate to, to use that word than a perk cell. And, and it takes more know-how and, and going from, you know, your your perk manufacturing gigawatts of perk cells and now switching to topcon is probably easier to do than manufacturing zero cells no cells and starting your topcon plant um because more can go wrong and, and the production window is just tighter you know some of these layers in the cells are are nanometers Thin, and if you screw that up, we see PID issues in our testing. And so we, we do see that in uh, some, some recent Topcon uh, bills of material that we've tested. Similarly, for heterojunction, it uses a whole different soldering process. You need to use low temperature soldering. So some of these manufacturers that are switching from PERC, where they've been you know, reliably soldering PERC cells, and even before that, um, uh, BSF, aluminum BSF cells, you know, now they're trying to use that same soldering mentality with, with heterojunction and the thermal cycling results are not where they should be. Uh, again, we see, we see great results for some modules, uh, in PID for Topcon and for thermal cycling for, for, uh, HJT, but it's a wider range that's going to take time to, to tighten. And all of that, what I'm referring to is results from factories overseas. You know, these are not results from U.S. factories. We see very few bombs coming in for that. So, you know, there's there's going to be a learning curve. And I fully support Kim's philosophy of I don't want those first modules coming off the line, um, especially for, you know, manufacturers that are not well, well versed at, at doing this. Okay, well, um, over to you, Alex Burrows from Exawatt. Um, so Tristan was just telling us about some some of the bill of material is is also important. It's not just the cell structure itself when it comes to manufacturing quality. The 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 bomb plays a big role with some of these N type technologies. We are seeing a different uh, bomb in the module stack. Um, what can you tell us about some of these uh, differences and kind of implications for for manufacturers? Yeah, so the biggest difference that we see uh, is potentially in the encapsulation layers. So it used to be that EVA was fairly standard. Now with Topcon heterojunction, there's a lot of shift towards PoE, which are polyolefin encapsulants, or to EPE, which is a, an EVA, PoE, EVA uh, co-extruded stack. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that to reduce issues with moisture sensitivity and with PID as well. Um, we saw some of that with PERC with dual glass modules, but we're certainly seeing a lot more of that with Topcon uh, and with Hatchery Junction as well. That adds a little bit of cost, but it doesn't change the, the fundamental uh, sort of calculus that we've seen where it has become very similar cost per watt to manufacture a Topcon module if you're an integrated manufacturer. 
as it is to manufacture a perk module. A little bit cost more per module, but the higher power offsets that. So the cost per watt to manufacture is very similar now. Um, but you can sell your Topcon module at a premium of you know something in the region of one cents per watt. Uh, so so that's one of the big shifts. You know there are other shifts say at the cell level for heterojunction. A lot of manufacturers are moving towards uh, silver copper pastes as well. Um, and then there are some shifts that are not technology dependent. So there's a lot more interest than there used to be in steel frames, for example. Um, and that's not sort of a cell technology specific shift, but it's something that we're seeing as the more interest in cost of frames and more interested in more manufacturers and, and buyers interested in tracking the emissions that come from the manufacturing um, and shifting to a steel frame can reduce emissions, say, compared to an aluminium frame. So there's, there's a lot going on, but um, you know, some of the biggest shifts that are related to technology are certainly in the encapsulation. Um, and I'm sure Tristan will be seeing that in, in what PVEL are seeing in their, the bombs that they test as well in that kind of changes. Well, another, yeah. oh, Tristan, over to you. Well, just to say, yeah, we, we do see that. Uh, another thing we're also starting to see is US made encapsulants, US made back sheets. You know, there's a big push to onshore that whole supply chain. And that presents risks as well, because, you know, these uh, manufacturers like Trina have been, they've got relationships going back probably 25 years with some of these encapsulant suppliers. They've audited them, you know, they're, they're quite close with them and they know how the materials are going to perform during lamination, for example. And now to try to get to that 40% domestic content without the U.S. made cell, manufacturers are looking at sourcing local materials from, you know, new production lines. And, and in some cases, you know, it's, it's a different base uh, resin. So as, as Alex was saying, uh, POE or EPE instead of the traditional EVA. And, you know, there's, there's a lot to learn um, on the, on the component manufacturer side, as well as the module manufacturer that has to put these together in, in a, module that's going to be reliable in Kim's projects for the next 25 to 30 years. Okay, but it's also a big opportunity as well, right? Not only will it be cell and, and predominantly module production, but there's also opportunities for, you know, the whole supply chain to be established. And that's, that's you know, a, a risk for sure, but also an opportunity for the US industry um, in terms of job creation and innovation and and um, the, the whole economic benefits. Um, we've talked a lot about the cell um, and, and kind of module technologies, but of course, like innovation isn't only the, the cell stack um, and the semiconductor layer. There's also things that can be done to the kind of module construction, um, particularly when we look at things um, like in installation. Minwa, what, what are you seeing as opportunities for potential US manufacturers to innovate kind of on this module level and, and even work closely with their installation partners? Yeah, I, I think there's a, a, a really big opportunity. And I think a lot of people are, you know, before there was um, more focus on, you know, as we as we get into this robotic age, <laughs> um, you know, before there there was uh, more more focus on maybe trying to uh, automate from from a manufacturer um, point of view in the, in the factory um, robots automated lines, and and I think now that is shifting beyond just the factory and um, into installation as well. Um, pe uh, people who are interested in as these as the demand for solar grows much larger and we accelerate the installation of how much solar goes in in the US, it's going to, I think, necessitate more construction automation. Um, and that means, uh, you know, um, more, more robotic and sort of start smart technologies in um, pile driving and, um, and maybe even in like bringing modules to the right place and um, and and um, robotically installing uh, modules and and all of that. So and and that I think that brings in not just a 
you know, maybe design in the in the thinking about more large scale of um, module like design. Um, maybe there's like you know nooks that standard that become standardized in the module design that can you know fit with um, having a standardized like mounting system, uh, mounting holes or things like that. Um, so yeah, I think, but I think it's going to require a lot of coordination um, in the industry between um, not just module manufacturers, but also um, mounting system and inverter manufacturers to and and EPCs and developers um, to see how everything can um, be automated on a larger scale. From a, yeah, sure, and yeah. and an opportunity there for manufacturers to work with the EPCs and installation companies um, to, to speed things up, to, to um, be able to execute projects more quickly. Robotic um, installation and, and kind of pre-assembly, is this something, um, Kim from S3 Power, that you're looking at as a project developer? Well, let's see. I love the idea that a robot can't call in sick or car break down. So that, that's always a nice thing to think about. Um, I don't think that module installation labor isn't really, isn't the item in the EPC price that really, that, that really breaks or makes it. I think the way I would think about it is probably um, the potential time savings that you would get from that. I think that, that you know, time on site is is really a cost driver in the EPC price. I think the idea of reducing human error is also really attractive. Um, I think the one thing that I'm always uh, cognizant of is like I've had serial defects on on you know with modules on projects, and it is really difficult to tackle because it's just death by a thousand cuts. And I think where I'd be really worried is that there's a bug in the robot or robots don't like dusty, windy environments, where which is kind of where a lot of solar projects are. You know, like those are the things that I would take into consideration before putting a robot on my site. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Thank you for that. Kim, well, then from a quality standpoint, um, uh, Tristan, what do you think about kind of automation? And, and we're seeing things like pre-assembly as well of some kind of uh, some types of arrays um, designed to be more assembled in the factory rather than in the field. Um, what do you see as these approaches um, from a quality standpoint? Uh, well, we haven't tested um, a lot of those like pre-assembly where you put all of the modules on the torque tube and then the torque tube is dropped into place. We have done some of that field testing and generally it looks fairly good, uh, especially with glass glass modules. You know, we're we're seeing in our own like hail testing and mechanical load testing, as well as in that field testing, it's very difficult to create a new cell crack inside of a glass glass module. Um, just with the, the cells sitting in the neutral plane of that laminate. Um, so, you know, I think if you're going to use a glass glass module and and transport the modules outside of the manufacturer's packaging, I, you know, I would that would be my pick for that rather than um, a glass backsheet module that could still have micro cracks. That said, even with multi bus bar modules, like some of these Topcon cells are have like 18 to 20 um, bus bars on them. With that, we're seeing that cell cracks matter less than they have previously, and there's there's less power loss due to them. So I think maybe that helps to enable, you know, some of these uh, non standard uh, transportation methods of modules where, you know, previously in my career, we tried to, when I was at, at a developer, we tried to pre-assemble modules on racking and lift it up onto the roof. And those look like someone hit a hammer with every cell by the time they yeah. were done with it. It, it did not that's look a, pretty. Tristan, that's exactly where my head went. Like if this were, you know, five, six, seven years ago and all the sites are perfectly flat, beautiful fields, then I think showing up with a torque tube full of modules is an awesome idea. But, you know, like I'm looking at some serious topography in some of my sites here in Nevada. And I'm, you know, I it is a challenge to get the GSU in. It's a challenge to get the, the best in. And now I'm thinking about bringing in, which 
I mean, I came from wind and it's smaller than the tubes and the, and the blades that you have to bring in, but it's still like, that's still a big feat over a lot of, um, rocky, uneven terrain. I, I would be really nervous about that and really look to, you know, a DNV or a PVL to, to help me understand if that, if that makes sense. Well, let's look to a DNV. Minwa? Well, you, you yeah, said I mean, there's so many, and, you know, when we talk about um, construction automation, there's so many ways of, of, of doing it. And we're seeing like so many different approaches that um, the industry is, uh, trying like starting to tap trying to tap into um and so certainly you know pre-assembly on a on of modules on onto a torque tube maybe one approach um there's also other approaches of having sort of um you know pop-up factories at the site um and where you have kind of a contained uh like factory pop up factory, so to speak, at at a container um, at the site where you know all of this quality testing can happen um, in uh, while you know not not uh, out on you know in in a more controlled environment than just out being windswept uh, and uh, sun dried <laughs> out there, you know. So um, yeah, and and you know, and then there's other kind of manufacturers who are looking more at the oh, is there a way to standardize um, mounting equipment and you know module equipment to you know have it all um, install more quickly um, because everything's standardized, you know. So there's there's a lot of different ways to to to, to think about it, and um, I I. I just think that with the amount of solar that all of these renewable energy goals are looking towards and the acceleration um, of installation, I think it will necessitate some form of um, automation in, in the future. And I think that's where um, where that sort of come comes into play. But you know, everything that you said, like Kim and, and Tristan like the the having the it's not it's not just the installation piece but it's also the the fact that um you can have a more a more there's the quality um piece of it uh, more uniform quality um if you can do that in a more controlled environment um and also taking the um the labor intensity of um having you know as as the climate gets warmer and and uh climate gets more extreme you know um there's also things to think about and with labor crews um being out there okay so it's definitely of interest and has potential but it is an emerging technology it's not perhaps quite there yet um, speaking of emerging technologies on the cell level, um, Alex Barry is from Exawatt. W what about perovskites then, perovskite tandems? Um, is there any um, future for that in you know, the, the duration of the IRA, the, the 10 years? Or I suppose you'd be looking sooner rather than later to establish that. Yeah, so I think there are definitely companies looking at that and whether they think they can commercialize it fast enough um, to be worth looking at the US uh, and whether they would be able to capitalize on those incentives. Uh, realistically, I think I think of tandems more as a, a big story for the 2030 to 2035 timeframe, um, which probably pushes them uh, a little bit too late for the IRA incentives. I think we'll see commercial products before that, um, but it will be relatively niche. And we may well see some, you know, some US manufacturing. But I think when it comes to tandems taking large market share and being, you know, a real big player in the market, uh, top, top corner on HJT, then you're, you know, I think at the moment we're, we're more likely to be looking at that in the early 2030s. Um, there's definitely still a bit of work to be done to get and manufacturability all from the same devices rather than from very similar devices that uh, don't quite manage to combine all of those into one. 
Okay. Tristan, pair of skites, what's your take? Uh, I, I would say 2030 as well, you know, at least five years, but I, I was at a conference last week and, and a number of manufacturers were very bullish about uh, their perovskite plans, specific their perovskite plans in the U.S. Uh, and their, you know, perovskite slash tandem plans. Um, I actually hosted a panel and one of the manufacturers said that they were going to start shipping in 2024 and i said 2024 that seems really fast and they said i actually no I, it should be 2025 and i said 2025 that seems really fast and he said I, I, well 2026 let's call it 2026 and afterwards a couple of people called me out on on you know pushing him too hard on his on his announcements but you know that said um there was a lot of conversation ab about um about tandem and and about that being a path to to domestic content uh, advantage, where we're not just competing against, you know, modules from Southeast Asia or or from elsewhere, and the U.S. is actually bringing back uh, innovation and and setting ourselves apart on a on an efficiency level and a technology level. And I think that's you know long term, that's how the U.S. is going to succeed in this. It's not just trying to copy the factories in in the U.S or sorry, copy the factories overseas, you know, uh, during that conference, there was speakers talking about their, you know, 500 megawatt, one gigawatt cell line. And uh, Tongway was there and they were talking about by the end of this year, they're going to have 100 gigawatts of Topcon cells. And it's just like, come on, we are not going to compete with that, you know, just on a on a, a economies of scale. It ain't happening. So, you know, I, I am now more bullish on on tandems and perovskites. I think 2026 is still uh, a pretty lofty goal, but you know, it, it people are 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 working on it and and they want to do it in the U.S. So that's that's exciting. Well, and durability is the big challenge to overcome with perovskites. There, there's tests that are you know you're seeing 1,000 hours, but of course you need many more multiples of that for a module to really be of any interest at all to put, put it in the field. Is that right, Tristan? Durability is still the biggest challenge? Um, yeah, I, you know, I haven't been studying it too closely because I thought it was going to be a 2030 thing. And and at the conference, it, it, you know, people were asking like, well, what's PVAL's take on this? And I said, well, we're we're still worried about all the failure, new failure modes of TopCon and HJT. We're not even looking at at perovskites we we do have to look at it more now though and yeah i think i think durability is is a is a big concern and you know how long are these modules going to to last in the field it's it's great to make i don't know a 35 percent efficient cell that's two centimeters by two centimeters but um you know, try selling that to kim on a on a hundred megawatt project and she's she's not biting i i imagine so you know we've we've got a long way to to go but there are a lot of brilliant minds focused on on overcoming some of those challenges so it is it is quite exciting and we're talking a lot about periscope tandems it can also be tandems with things like a thin film or a cadmium telluride layer um alex you were going to jump in also so yeah i was just gonna say i think you know, one of the things with perovskites as well is even when we're at the point where we have a device that, uh, you know, is, is manufacturable at the costs that you want, at, you know, can be used in a large scale module that Tristan can test, that he can sign off the fact that it's doing well in the tests. I think it's going to take a while for people to not be scared that they're going into early. You know, as we were saying earlier, the first modules off the line might be a bit scary. And I mean, all that we've had since you know, since I did my PhD in perovskites has been fears about perovskites and stability and degradation in lifetime. So I think even when these things are doing well in tests, you're going to have a lot of buyers wanting to uh, be reassured by longer term data from the field. So I think it's going to take, you know, even when everything is solved, I think there's going to be a little bit of a delay there while people uh, get on board with the fact that that is the case. Um, and are reassured by the fact that people are, are installing these things in real world applications and they are 
you know, starting to show promise and and not throw up all sorts of challenges that weren't thrown up in some of the lab tests, for example. And is lead content also an issue? D different opinions on that, um, dep dep depending on who you ask. Um, I don't think it's an insurmountable challenge to have a small amount of lead in your module. Okay, um, that's a that's a diplomatic answer and probably pretty close um, when you're putting it between two pieces of glass and um, then getting it out into the field in all sorts of weather conditions. Well, I think that's been a, a wonderful um, discussion from all of you about technologies and manufacturing. Um, I really appreciate all of your insights. Uh, great to get the quality perspective, the technology and manufacturing pers perspective, risk um, minimization um, and testing perspective, and also from a developer. So thank you very much for your time. Alex Barrows from Exawatt, Tristan Arion Larico from PVEL, Minwa Leong from DNV, and Kim Primerano from Estuary Power. Thank you for joining us here on Roundtables US 2023. Well, thank you also for joining this manufacturing and technology session. I think we had um, a most interesting discussion about what the manufacturing landscape in the US could potentially look like um, and some really interesting insights into the role of innovation in terms of um, the long-term competitiveness and sustainability of the US production industry. And Fisher, I see that you have joined me on the stage. Um, we've got the quality session just coming up in a few moments, um, and I do encourage you to join that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, dual glass modules will very much be in focus. Large format modules will be in focus, and we'll also be discussing cell cracking and some of those implications. Um, but until then, I'm Jonathan Gifford, the Editor-in-Chief of PV Magazine Global, and these are the Roundtables US. Back to you, Anne. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan will be returning to moderate our next session, Maintaining Quality, Reliability and Durability with Meeting Growing Demand. We will hear from experts from Longy, NREL, Zeitview, PI Berlin, and KWH Analytic who share insights on best practices and key issues. But first, we'll be taking a short networking break. I invite all of our virtual attendees to take advantages of this time to connect with other industry experts through the platform, the platform's various networking features. See you back at 1245 Eastern. <laughs>